are literally shaping the planet. Purpose is the only pathway to a regenerative future. We have a choice to stay with the status quo or to change. What is the point of trying to be just resilient when we can actually innovate? Hi, I'm, I'm Aaron uh, Schiller. I have a design and architecture practice. We, we focus a lot on um, uh, material ecology, which is a bit of what we're uh, going to talk about today from an investment point of view, what we're uh, seeing on the ground from four different points of view, from our point of view as specifiers, from Nicole's point of view, uh, uh, researching the climate impacts, Jeffrey's point of view on um, uh, deep research and analysis specific to the regional Northeast and what the impacts and capacities for mass timber are there. And then from Chris Carbone's point of view, which is out in the field, having led for over a decade now, some of the most significant timber uh, and timber engineering efforts uh, in, the, in the Northeast and across the United States. So what we thought we'd do, uh, if it works for everybody, is we'll, we'll, I'll share the screen and each of us will talk for about five minutes. And Nicole, Jeff, Chris, if you want to say anything else as you go into your portions, I think that would be the best time to do that. So I'll um, share this now. Assuming everybody has that, someone on my panel can nod. Thank you guys. So we're gonna talk about mass timber as a technology that's reshaping the field of construction. Our different companies um, are at the bottom of this. Um, as I said, Nicole's specialty is really understanding and bringing um, investment to the field of, of timber as a solution for climate change. Jeff's research in the Northeast in developing mass timber manufacturing and then Chris's uh, expertise uh, and um, view of the change in demand for these things over the last 10 years from the field. So what is the problem we're looking at? From a construction point of view, we're looking at a need to build things faster with less people. A lot of look at prefabrication across construction technologies. Then we also have the impact of climate change and what carbon is going to cost us long-term. A lot of you are familiar, uh, I believe, with having an AEC background, understanding that we've been talking for 20 years now about the life cycle operations of our buildings, net zero buildings being a, a pretty common term. What we're focused on professionally and, and trying to focus the field on is the moment from conceptualization through the end of construction. So prior to when you'd start over 10, 20 years, getting a return on carbon efficiencies from the way your building is operating because it has tight windows and good energy systems, actually really focused on the embed, embodied carbon and waste that's in the construction process itself. So just taking out uh, building operations and looking at building materials, you can see that it's a much bigger piece of the pie to think about the way we build buildings than just to think about the way we run buildings. And if you're serious about climate change as something you want to invest in a profitable way of, of combating, you have to look at technologies that are available now to start doing that. And that's really construction, not the operations of a building as much. So mass timber does that because it, it starts to expand everyone's capacity to think about the way we build from where and how we source our materials. Timber is the leading uh, a series of products, if you want to think about it that way, uh, for this, because it, it one, it's stoking demand by building with timber for a product that in and of itself is uh, healing the planet. Uh, trees during their lifetime uh, are sequestering carbon from the air, storing them in their trunks. We're then talking about storing that carbon up to 2x the life cycle of, of the tree by putting them into buildings, buildings that can then be recycled into other products or that can be then recycled into clean energy. So it's really stretching out the, uh, the, the carbon cycle um, and creating an opportunity for ourselves to sort of breathe within that moment, if you will. So then understanding that it has an impact, we have to think about what is mass timber. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase you may or may not be familiar with, but it's not a thing. It's really a family of products. And these, these products are packaged in different ways 
around different parts of the country and have different applicabilities, uh, whether you're in New York City or Seattle, Washington or Texas, all places where we're building in timber today, but that have different codes, restrictions and, and different things that are right in terms of how tall you want to build and, and how you use the products. So the one most people have heard about is in your top right here, it's called cross laminated timber. The easy way to think about that is plywood on steroids. Instead of using little sheets of material to fold up against and create rigidity, what you're doing is you're taking um, uh, a stock lumber, the kind of construction material that you would be using to frame a wall, but assembling it in a factory into panels. And those panels can get up to greater tensile strengths than steel, can become more fire resistant than that, and outperform concrete in, in certain systems. So, so what that looks like in the field is a combination of posts, beams, ceiling and flooring products, all coming off the back of semi trucks with a few carpenters and a crane operator and located where you're used to seeing steel framing and uh, concrete floors and decking. One of the great efficiencies is a building like this, an eight story mid rise in Minnesota is that it can go up up to 40% faster than an average building. And everybody on the panel is going to take a different part of this discussion on. This is a recent really successful office building by Heinz Development that's being repeated now in six different metropolitan areas with pretty much the same floor plan. Sometimes it's an apartment building, sometimes it's a commercial office building around the country. This is an affordable housing and commercial mixed use project at 90,000 square feet. Uh, in Portland, Oregon in construction right now. And then in Vancouver, we've got what uh, people are used to calling tall wood, which is here a 16 story building with a hybrid core, but predominantly an all timber high rise building. Uh, and, and Jeff and some of our other speakers can speak to that on uh, which one of these is in your region and, and how we conceptualize this all. Nicole, I'll, I'll turn to you to talk about the difference in the steel versus the concrete and the wide world in between. Thanks, Aaron, um, and thanks for having me to Shadow Ventures. My firm, Oliphant, uh, based here in Boston, is working on quantifying what we think is the real competitive difference with timber as a structural material versus steel and concrete and like age metal systems, which is its climate benefit. Um, there have been a number of life cycle analyses of sort of theoretical buildings showing the difference, but we here in Boston, we um, have a pilot to demonstrate the specifics of how much carbon is reduced as you start to add timber in and replace those traditional materials. And to think about how do we um, turn that into a market opportunity, both through policymakers who are concerned with reducing emissions as fast as possible um, across our economy and particularly from the building sector. And, um, and also as a signal for investment for um, more of a timber supply chain locally, which is what Jeff's gonna talk about. So as part of that, we've teamed up with um, an architecture firm here um, out of MIT named Generate Architecture and Technologies who have done two um, building designs, one for an eight story that would be for suburban uh, Metro Boston. This is what you're looking at here. And what they've done is figure out sort of a kit of parts set of designs where you can compare In the beginning, we've got a reference uh, building steel and concrete. The next one is just concrete. And then the others are showing what would happen if you start substituting timber for major uh, components of the structural system. So going from just floor slabs to cores to eventually if the entire building were made of wood. And what was stunning about it to us, this shows you, um, this graph is of global warming potential of the building, which is essentially the life cycle analysis uh, reference for how much carbon each building is responsible for putting in the atmosphere, even before you've turned on the heat and the lights and the air conditioning. So you see the base case scenario, reference one, concrete slabs on steel deck, steel frame, that's your base case, how much um, global warming potential, how much CO2 emissions you're putting into the air just by building that building. And this, the concrete reference point there, the next one over is uh, minus 2%. But as you go down, 
you start to put timber just in the floor slabs, you've reduced the CO2 emissions equivalent by 14%. Um, the average for like a most likely building that we found was sort of the sweet spot, which is a steel timber hybrid, it goes down to about 37% from the base case. And then if you really want to go crazy and use a whole wood building, it's 52% reduction. Now that is um, been conducted by the LCA has been conducted by Burrow Happold Engineering. So we have a, you know, an engineering firm who would be doing a building like this. Um, and we also partnered with Consigli Construction to start figuring out the costing um, of such a building. But what we can see here is even with sort of semi-low carbon concrete um, and efficient building design, you're going to get a dramatic reduction in the amount of CO2 that you're throwing into the atmosphere just by using some timber in the building. So the next slide is there's also now movement to, and Jeff's gonna talk about this more, but we're thinking about can we have a local supply? We have an incredible amount of timber in New England, particularly up in Maine where we've got sawmill infrastructure from the paper mills. And um, people wonder, well, you know, the forest is an important carbon resource, but you know, what happens if we start harvesting more for buildings? The fact is we are growing far more forest land, far more trees than we can cut down. And so we're going to continue to work on what building demand would look like for the forest, but this is just a nice quick thumbnail sketch of the difference between how much forest is growing and continuing to grow even after you've been doing um, pretty sizable removals in some of these counties where we've got um, mill infrastructure going already. And I'll transfer now to Jeff, who's going to talk more about that supply chain piece of it. All right, thank you, Nicole. Um, so Aaron noted toward the beginning of the presentation that Mass Timber is really a family of products. Um, my company, Trevirka, is focused specifically on cross-laminated timber. Um, so my comments over the next few minutes are going to be in the context of CLT only and not um, on the other Mass Timber products available on the market. Uh, so as we look a bit deeper into the supply side of the equation um, and look at the potential for CLT manufacturing, in the Northeastern US. We can see that New England, as Nicole was alluding to, is really uh, very well situated to site a factory for CLT manufacturing. And it really comes down to three reasons. First, we grow the right trees needed to make CLT. Uh, second, we have that existing and pretty robust uh, forest product supply chain infrastructure. And third, that infrastructure sits uh, really right on top of several major US markets uh, that are very well poised to make use of CLT over the coming years. Uh, so from a forest resource standpoint, the kind of wood needed to manufacture CLT is softwood, uh, specifically a grouping of species called spruce pine fir, or SPF. Um, and looking at the map we have up on the screen, you can see that the SPF forest type, which is the dark green, is really concentrated in northern New England, mostly in Maine, um, where there are about half a dozen sawmills that collectively produce about 500 million uh, board feet of SPF lumber every year. That's a lot of lumber, and it's the exact kind of lumber you need to make CLT panels. Um, so next slide. Of course, then we need to ask the question of whether there's enough wood growing in Maine's forests to support um, an associated increase in harvesting with CLT manufacturing. So if we looked at data provided by the US Forest Service, uh, we can see that Maine last year had an annual net growth of a little bit over 124 million cubic feet of wood, and that takes into account annual harvest and mortality. Um, so to put that number into context, a large scale CLT factory would consume somewhere on the order of six to eight million cubic feet of wood in a year. Uh, so the presence of a CLT factory in Maine really doesn't come close to even running the risk uh, that the annual harvest would exceed annual growth. So um, we and others feel very strongly that Maine's forests can easily support a sustainable supply of uh, wood for CLT manufacturing. Uh, so where is it currently being made? Um, it's a fairly, CLT is a fairly new product in North America, but it has been manufactured and used with great success in Europe for a couple of decades now. Um, and if we turn to where it's manufactured in North America, um, if we were to have shown you this map in 2016, you'd only have seen four dots up there. But there's a, been a significant amount of investment and development over the last few years. Uh, and today there are nine factories making structural CLT in North America with two more coming online within the next year. Uh, you can see that capacity is fairly well concentrated in the Pacific Northwest. 
Um, and the closest facility we have is Nordic Structures, uh, but there are a couple more coming online soon um, that will provide uh, more capacity to us here in the Northeast. But uh, another thing that's of, of significant importance to us here, especially on the East Coast, is the availability of product from existing European manufacturers who can supply uh, us here very cost competitively. Uh, so where is it being used? Um, in 2018, there were um, just shy of 500 projects uh, in development that were using mass timber in the U.S. If we look at that today, um, that number has about doubled. And here in the Northeast, uh, it's currently about 120 mass timber projects underway, 41 of which are actively under construction. And it's notable how much development is occurring on the East Coast, even without uh, much local manufacturing yet. If we look at uh, projected demand, uh, it's certainly projected to rise steadily over the coming years. And this is looking at CLT specifically in the Northeast. Um, and by 2025, it's likely going to reach a capacity that could support um, local manufacturing in New England. Uh, but as we look at this growth potential, um, there's gonna be a few barriers we really need to pay close attention to. Um, and specifically, I'll call your attention to the building codes, the material costs and market familiarity. We obviously don't have time to do a deep dive into any of these, but uh, just a couple quick notes on the building codes. The International Code Council has adopted changes to the uh, International Building Code coming out in 2021 that will allow mass timber and buildings up to 18 stories. Um, so local adoption of these changes is something to keep a close eye on. On costs, uh, manufacturers will continue to need to find ways to reduce the cost of CLT material as it's delivered uh, to the Northeast. Uh, by our estimate, they need to bring the price down by an additional four to $6 per square foot on five ply panels to really start making uh, significant inroads in the market here. And then on market familiarity, um, I really can't emphasize enough the importance of working with a design team that has experience in mass timber. Um, with mass timber projects, there are certain decisions you need to make earlier than you would with other materials. Your design team really needs to be using uh, 3D design software from the beginning, and you need to have people involved who understand the nuances of the mass timber supply chain. Um, one of the most experienced companies in mass timber construction today is Benson Wood, and we're lucky to have Chris to talk to us a little bit more about their experience and the material, um, with the material and the potential they see. So I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yep, I'm Chris Carbone. I've been with Bensonwood since 2003. I'm a structural engineer. I, I came right out of MIT and went to Bensonwood because they were um, the best timber framing company around, and I knew I wanted to work in biomaterials as an engineer. Um, one of the few places that actually had an engineer on staff. Um, and when I got there, mass timber simply meant big timber. Um, and mo more often than not, that meant a salvaged piece of material coming out of an old mill building uh, on the order of 12 by 16 inches, uh, usually with some rot or damage or other unexpected um, challenges to work with. Um, and, and when we would use those materials, we'd use them because they were dry. They had had the benefit of time to dry out. When you cut down a tree, it's pretty wet. It can be up to 50% water. Um, and it takes time for t trees to dry out. When we build them into glue lambs, uh, we cut the trees into lumber and we dry that lumber down to 15% moisture content in order for the glue to set. And um, so when you buy a glue lamb, you're buying a de facto dry piece of wood. And, and so salvage material, that, that cost a lot of money. You would have to harvest it from the mill and then you'd have to take all the nails and stuff out of it so you didn't ruin your saws. And then you'd have to resize it to the, to the actual size that you wanted um, to use in the, in the project. Um, and so it was, it was very difficult to come by and the flooring industry in the 80s kind of took it over and, and sliced it up and made a lot more money out of it that way. Um, so when we needed big timbers, we would have to radio frequency kiln dry them, which was expensive. Um, whether they got big in section or if they get long in length, you also paid a premium um, just because finding bigger, longer trees is expensive. So we got this steeple job in 2008. Uh, steeple got hit by lightning and, and um, the original steeple was made out of masonry and the historic engineer wanted to do the replacement out of timber for cost reasons, lugging stones 90 feet in the air. And so they came to us and said, what should we do? And for some reason, somebody had the idea to use um, glue lambs so that they would be dry and straight and run through our robotic machines to cut them. Um, so in order for the machines to cut things, we need straight, very good tolerance. And uh, we didn't pay any premium because you're just paying per board foot, essentially per unit cost of the actual wood. 
Um, so that was really the introduction for me for the benefit of glue lamb. We were able to build that steeple in our shop and, and, um, and then glue lamb turned into CLT as CLT came into the market. Um, my company has been a, a home building company really for 40 years and we specialized in timber framing. Ted was one of the founders of the guild in the seventies. And eventually we, we pretty quickly, actually, we, we uh, added the insulated envelope to our uh, palette of, of offerings. And that was at first foam core structural insulated panels. And through that work with big panels and, and timbers, we were very well uh, poised to, to jump on the CLT wagon. We know how to rig and fly large panels with cranes and how to pre-cut them and bring them to the site effectively and, and dealing with the logistics of that. Um, and the opportunities that, that the Mass Timber brought to us with curves and things that CNC driven machinery can cut um, really opened up some design uh, opportunities for us. Um, so academic and institutional work, they're kind of at the bleeding edge. They're the, they're the clients that can, you know, think about um, long-term investments and uh, long-term payoffs and also training the future architects and engineers how to use this material. Single family residential, that, that has been a big uh, factor for us, largely because that's the market we played in predominantly but it's also a good scale for architects to get their hands dirty and try to understand the material. However, it's not a great scale for gaining the efficiency in terms of cost. Um, so that's why I've, I've bolded those two market sectors, but the other ones are all sort of players in the mass timber, um, certainly commercial and retail spaces. We've done a number of gas stations and um, office sort of not office buildings, but retail establishments, um, Art and Civic, we've done a number of art, art building, art exhibits and public structures, um, sports venues. We've done uh, baseball uh, stands and uh, baseball venues, transportation, bus shelters, things like that. And then office buildings and multifamily residential. So these are the future market, in my opinion. And we're just starting to get our hands wet um, with these bigger sort of structures here at our company. Um, next slide, please. And, and COVID-19 kind of did hit us uh, pretty hard with, with, with those two markets, and I'll get into those in a second. But really, Mass Timber um, offers a lot of potential. We can build uh, things that are very straightforward structurally, or we can build things that are very complicated structurally. And, and the ones that are straightforward structurally are kind of you're using your panels in the way a, a you know, precast concrete deck or a site cast concrete deck might be basically just as a floor panel and you're just using a post and a beam as a post and a beam. Um, and in the future, there will be many, many projects where the project, where the wood comes directly from the mill, prefabricated from the mill and sent to the job site to be installed by six to eight carpenters. What my company has done recently is more of the projects where we're taking components and bringing them to our factory. If you could go back to the last slide, the, the picture on the right, um, that's a 104 foot steel concrete, steel wood truss where the top cord is glue lamb and you can see the top cords being worked in our shop, but the rest of the members are steel. Um, so we had to bring the, the fittings into our shop to fit them and make sure that everything would go together on site. On a project like that, you're not gaining the efficiency of um, reducing labor. And, and so I'm curious as to when Jeff says we need to bring it down five bucks a square foot, if that's unit cost or installed cost, and, and maybe we can talk about that during the Q&A. But if you go to the next slide, um, this the next slide is one of the projects that did slow down with COVID. This is a five, four story, five story, whatever you want to say, um, office building in Malden, Massachusetts. Um, the contract was inked in early February, and um, they, they have the foundation, I think, in at this point, but the project is on hold, and we have nearly a million dollars worth of wood in our parking lot as a result of it. So um, COVID is a reality. It has slowed a lot of job sites down or completely put things on hold, but I expect we will get through this at some point uh, next year, and, and I think there's a lot of players out there ready to ready to dig some holes. Another project that went on hold um, is this project in, in Boston in Roxbury um, that Generate uh, was the lead designer on, but now is transitioning over to Placedaler as a design builder. Um, that project went on hold when Boston shut down their construction sites. Um, 
and PlayStaler had to put a bunch of their things on hold, but um, it is now picked back up and um, we expect to be delivering this multifamily um, next summer. Um, it is a type four construction. So for those of you who don't know the building code, uh, type four is a traditional mass timber or heavy timber type. It was based on the old mill buildings. Um, in 2015, they added CLT to type four and made some ways to use mill construction, uh, basically with CLT walls instead of brick walls. Um, that is being preserved in the new building code. It will be called type four HT, heavy timber. And there are three other type four buildings um, that will allow you to go even taller than the existing type four, up to 18 stories, as I think Jeff said. Um, so this is a pretty exciting time for us and I thank you for your opportunity here. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, Jeff, and Cole. That was really great, well-rounded uh, capture of seeing this at different tiers from carbon profiling to um, development of the product to what we're seeing in terms of market demand out there right now. I will stop the share in order to go to the Q&A. Nick, I'm not sure how you wanted to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can just go through the, the questions. We have one so far. Uh, so audience, feel free to put any any questions that you have for the group into the into the Q and A or the chat. Uh, but Jared asks, what is the environmental impact of timber versus longer lasting steel and concrete in terms of the life cycle of the building? That's a great question, uh, Nicole. Would you like to lead on that one? Sure, and I wonder if we should share that um, LCA slide again to address Not that. No You start, and I'll get it up. Okay. So, Jared, we did, uh, there have been LCAs done. We did one of a potential real project in uh, Boston, an eight-story, and we're also doing a similar one on a, a definite real project, 12-story, 170,000 square foot, comparing um, the carbon uh, impact of each building, of each timber type of building, um, compared to baseline steel and concrete or simply concrete. Um, and over the whole, it's a, it's a um, LCA done in the LCA vernacular going from cradle to grave, including end of life. And our end of life assumptions right now in TALI, which was the program that was used to do the LCA, are actually incredibly conservative on timber at the moment. They're assuming that timber is going to get tossed in a landfill or not recycled in some way. And still with that, you're seeing this step down in reduction of carbon uh, impact, environmental impact as you use more timber um, in the building. So our base case here is a steel and concrete building, something typical that we would see in Boston and probably many other cities because of the price of steel right now. Um, and as you add timber in, you've got the one, the third one over with just adding timber into the floor slabs, you get a 14% reduction in carbon throughout that entire um, life cycle of the building. The other thing I will say about long lasting, um, one of the slides that we like to show sometimes is of a glue lamb beam, which is a type of mass timber that's in a beam structure um, compared with, a, you know, in a building and showing a picture of a building at Fort Point Channel in Boston, which is uh, probably 200 years old with a massive um, timber beam. Timber lasts a long time. There's no reason for it to seem like a less long lasting material than steel or concrete. And yet what it doesn't do is put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which persists for a hundred years or more. So, so that's the kind of equation that we're balancing here. Is that- uh, just, If I could add, uh, you know, as a structural engineer, we design for 50 year loads. Um, right. So, you know, if you want a building that lasts longer, just let us know. And timber <laughs> can definitely do that. Um, provided that we take the precautions that we need and, and keep it dry and don't let bugs eat it. Um, those are kind of the big concerns for us, but. During the construction process, correct? Well, or in the life of the building, we don't want the roof leaking and rotting out the timbers. I mean, but that you could have problems with your ceiling concrete if your roof is leaking too. Right. Yeah. So this LCA was conducted assuming all things equal in terms of how, what's expected of the building performance and longevity. So, so then on top of Nicole, that was excellent. And on top of that, you've got to think about what the building can do with its, its pieces long-term. I think Jeff, the, or I forget whose uh, question this was. The other thing to think about is um, what timber can do 
uh, to restore existing buildings and add to the life cycle of uh, what we call adaptive reuse. So we have over um, uh, 10,000 ma historic masonry structures in the Northeast, and that's probably a significant undercount. You're talking about old mill buildings, old office buildings, old, old factory plants. You can think of Mass Mocha. Buildings that are, are structural masonry that will just be put to waste if we knock them down. And so we have to recycle those buildings. Well, in, in Center City, Philadelphia, uh, you can't add a glass tower on top of a masonry post building, but you can add a timber tower because timber is, uh, it, generally speaking, weighs a lot less than concrete and steel. So we can rejuvenate already spent buildings that we need to resuscitate in urban centers and add timber components to them to increase their density, increase their height, and add another 50 to 100 years of life to them. So there's multiple ways to use this technology. Or if you're building in a, a new, in a poor soil condition, you can, you yeah. know, you have less weight on your foundations just to begin with. That's great. Thank, thank you all for that response. So we're, uh, we're out of time, but we have one last question. So I'm going to give, um, I'm going to state the question, whoever wants to take it. We have, we, we have 30, let's, let's shoot for 30 seconds for an answer uh, so we can introduce Sarah, our next speaker here. Uh, but Akshay asks, um, how does this technology translate to more human environments? Uh, are there alternative sources of wood being used for those types of environments? And do, do the advantages still remain from the standpoint of maintenance costs, et cetera? I can talk about that as an architect. Uh, the buildings uh, are in general, especially in Europe, they lease a lot faster because they're more attractive. They, uh, they tend towards higher insulation and energy performance than standard materials. And they're, they're biodynamic, meaning they're buildings that are um, where the air quality is greater and the visual, uh, as you can see from this image, the visual play is really attractive. People like to be in things that are of organic materials. And uh, by building with organic materials, we create better, healthier conditions in our buildings and in our interiors and in our airflows. Very succinct, Aaron, thank you. Um, well, appreciate the time, everyone. This was a great discussion. The only thing I would ask of you is if you do have a few minutes after this session, please join our Slack channel. Uh, I think the audience probably has some, some additional questions for you. Um, and if you can drop your contact info in, in there, if, any, if anyone um, would like to contact any of our panelists, feel free to, to meet them in Slack. Uh, thank you all again. This was, this was outstanding. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.